located in the heart of Imuscavite, is one of the most unique ancestral houses in the area, built during the pre-war era, the Belia House. Coming from the name itself, the Belia family was known to be one of the wealthiest families in Imus, with its patriarch, Jose Belia, who was once a judge during his time. And as a lawyer, his ability to think in different ways manifested as to how he designed his family home. With years of neglect and abandonment heavily diminished the state of the house, the house now poses safety and health hazards such as detached and near-falling wood panels, piled leftover food donations, a heavily damaged fence, falling ceiling panels exposing electrical wires, and destroyed concrete balcony railings. So what was once a grand and eclectic house now looks like a haunted one, like in every horror movie. Speaking of, this scene here was shot right in the Bella house. And here's another familiar staircase. So what makes this Bella house so intriguing and valuable? Its defining elements make the house stand out from the now modern neighborhood. We have Victorian elements evident in the octagonal shape of the exterior walls and steep pointed roofs. Additionally, its rear porch newels, front porches, wall finishes, ceiling patterns, and balconies are some examples of other Victorian elements seen. Aside from Victorian elements, Jose Bellia also added some Spanish colonial components such as ventanillas, which is a small opening between the floor and the windows, and stained glass caliados, which is a small window in between the ceiling and the walls to provide adequate ventilation indoors. And lastly, another defining element of the house is its neoclassical components, evident in its Corinthian columns, bracketed eaves, and wall ornaments found mostly around the carport. But before we look at what the house could be in the future, we have to understand its past. In 1932, the Bella family used the house as their residential home and openly allowed the house to be used as a filming location for Filipino movies. Then, Sometime in the early 2000s, the Bella children separated and left the house abandoned after the death of their parents. And in 2007, the children sold the house to Cardinal Tagle under the jurisdiction of the Diocese of Imus, with the church using it as a rectory for priests until 2010. From 2010, the house was given a new purpose as a center for children and welfare development. Here. Several feeding programs and volunteer projects were held by different organizations and groups. But this would only last until 2013, when plans for the renovation of the house were proposed. But all plans would fall through due to conflicts on the church's side and engineers. So, the big question is, how are we bringing the Bella House back to life? Well, first of all, Cavite occasionally hosts children-friendly activities managed by the church, the government, and volunteer organizations. Kentuan Sa Plaza during sundowns, Wagayway Festival during the month of May, frequent feeding programs are some community-filled projects done in Imus that cater to the children of the community. So with that in mind, we will be looking at those children ages 9 and below as our main stakeholders. And where and what can we find these kids doing at an early age? With children ages 5 and under, focus on sensory play and activities that simulate their senses and build their comfortability with the environment as these children are too young to go to school but are old enough to process their surroundings. With that, we considered five main components in the decision-making process. So how did we decide on adapting the Bella House and turn it into the Bella Center for Children Welfare and Development or basically an orphanage? At the end of Tehimik Street is a cemetery. Cemeteries are known to be hot spots for abandoned and neglected children. Most parents also decide to leave their unwanted infants in cemeteries. For young children, they could often be seen playing around and jumping from one tomb to another. The World Bank data also shows that the Philippines has 47 births annually per 1,000 women aged 15 to 19 years old. Consequently, this age group is what governs the population in the surrounding barangays of the Bella House. And in this age, 
most parents are incapable of fully supporting and providing for their child, which results in poverty and abuse. In the topics of sustainability, we'll be talking about three things, social, economic, and environmental. Socially, we'd look at it through its development within the community. Through an orphanage, the surrounding community would be able to participate and conduct volunteer programs for the children. The orphanage could also provide employment opportunities in the area. House mothers and caretakers are recruited in ensuring that the children are in a safe and well-conducive environment. By renovating that area, we could utilize it to contain passive solar elements that aid in cooling and make it into a simple space for the children and the community to use. And what's more important to note is that, with the current situation and community response, the Bella House is already intended by the church and known by the community as a Children Welfare and Development Center. It just doesn't look like it physically. So after months of planning and researching, what does the Bella House now look like as an orphanage? The proposed development plan features a new rendition of the Bella House with improved spaces that cater to the needs of the children while giving off a welcoming ambiance to the community. Looking at the house from all four sides, major improvements and repairs have been done. The goal for the renovation of the facade was to bring back its impactful characteristics by retaining and repairing its colonial architectural details. Through bringing to life the structure's eye-catching attributes, the entrance of the house will be able to show the center's intent to be a safe space for the children. Additionally, the car park could house up to four vehicles for guests and clients. The destroyed Corinthian columns in this area were repaired and maintained and still continues to be used as one of the house's main structural supports. Major innovations and cleanup were done to the exterior of the house, especially in addressing the house's structural integrity, the statement of its overgrown vegetation, and other safety hazards. On the other hand, the interior of the house had focused more on maintenance, replacement works, and reprogramming of spaces. Finally entering the house, guests and clients alike are greeted by a large foyer decorated with art deco wall motifs followed by the common area lined with a very neoclassical deck railing that leaves the area very open with the outdoor breeze being able to easily circulate within the space. Powder rooms on the ground floor are also provided for use by everyone, even visitors. Also located in the ground floor, to accommodate the learning needs of the children, a daycare center for infants and a classroom for younger children are added. These spaces are also accessible for the public to use, particularly volunteer individuals or groups who wish to donate or extend their services in the betterment of the children's educational experience. To lessen electricity costs, the opening between the partition and the ceiling were retained to improve the ventilation of the enclosed space and ensure that there is a constant flow of air. For the recreational activities of the children, the dining area and the kitchen are situated near one another for easy access and smooth flow. The dining area can hold up to 15 seats, mainly used by the children and the house parents. The orphanage also encourages the children to participate in recreational activities like baking and cooking. Hence, the large size of the kitchen and an auxiliary structure behind the dining area that houses the laundry room and the utilities. On the second floor, what used to be unmaintained and uninhabited rooms are now converted into bedrooms. The smaller bedroom designated for infants, and the larger bedroom is designated for children. Starting off with the infant bedroom on the left, the antique wooden panels on the walls were preserved and cleaned, while the grills on the windows were replaced with galvanized steel for its durability and the safety of the users. One feature of the room is its octagonal shape once again adapting a Victorian architectural element in the structure. This shape of the bedroom is evident from both exterior and interior angles. On the opposite side of the second floor, the large bedroom was separated into two, one for the children and one for the house parents. In this room, a part of the wall is lined with stained glass from when the Bellas used to live there. It was placed there as a symbol of their wealth. The glass was retained as it served a dual purpose. One. It is a reminder of the Bella family's wealth in the area, and two, 
It allows light to pass through while protecting the privacy of the children in the room. As we're looking at the long-term establishment and effects of the orphanage through the community, we'll now assess six key performance indicators that determine the success and goals of the orphanage. These would also talk about the milestones and target goals of the proposal in the future. The branding of Babelia House also plays an important role in the performance of the orphanage, as it is how people remember and know the project. Within the community, the Babelia House is already known for numerous things, from a haunted house to an orphanage. The community already has an existing thought or idea of what the Babelia House should be a children welfare and development center. But with its pre-adapted state, the thought remains as a thought. The Bella Center's physical condition should be able to withstand natural disaster. It should also give a positive first impression on clients and visitors that the children are living in a safe environment and are provided with their basic necessities. And as a charity foundation, the economics and governance of the Bella Center are crucial as it needs financial support to maintain its operations. There are several plans to encourage financial support in the orphanage, such as As the orphanage main benefactor, a portion of the church's monetary donations should be given to support the orphanage. With the wide reach and audience of the church, they are able to encourage the masses in supporting their cause in adopting and providing children with their human rights. Other financial assistance could include private, public partnerships, and honorary fees from organizations. Future expansion is needed, which in turn would need more financial assistance. Thus, as of current, partnerships with other neighboring orphanages such as the Furlani Foundation are needed in order to ensure that all other age groups are accommodated by the Bella Center. Once the Bella Center is able to grow in management and operations, then future expansions and age accommodations are possible. Through adaptive reuse, there are more opportunities to live in the house. The Bellia House once again opens its doors to an active community, welcoming new and old experiences that adds value and impact to its people.